Rewind. All right. <laughs> Welcome fellow Toastmasters and guests. This meeting of online presenters has now begun. Guests, please know that in order to be a member of our club, you must be a current or former active member of Toastmasters International and have completed at least six Toastmaster official speeches, or alternatively, if you have substantial relevant presentation experience, you may apply for membership after demonstrating your abilities in a two to three minute speech delivered during one of our club meetings. All requests for membership are subject to approval by the members of our club. If you have not already done so, please change your panel to ensure it shows your name and role if you have one. Right click and select rename to do so. We have members and guests from many countries throughout the world. Thus, as a professional organization, we ask that you please be aware of language or word usage that may be considered offensive or otherwise insensitive due to cultural differences. Please note that we will be recording the meeting. Your video or audio contribution may be used for club marketing purposes. Also, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Please welcome our club president, DTM, Andy Byrne. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody and our guests to our club. We're beginning the new year. There is 172 days left this year, so make good use of that. We want to call your attention if you're an officer. I posted in the chat a number of trainings that you're eligible to go to, but if you find your own training in your own area that you would prefer to go to, just let us know when you've completed that so that we get credit as a club for having done training for our officers. I'll return it back to you, Toastmaster of the day. I have that as Jim Barber. Is that not true? Yes. That is true. I just wasn't <laughs> expecting you that quite that fast. Hi, everybody. I'm okay. Jim Barber. I'm your Toastmaster of the day, and we are getting ready for an incredible meeting. There has been a little discussion as to the fact that we are starting a little on the disorganized side. I prefer to think of this as proof, evidence, beyond evidence, proof that Toastmasters is, it's necessary for Toastmasters to be an ongoing experience. If you break away from Toastmasters for any amount of time, you lose a lot of what you gained. And we are proof of that tonight. We haven't met for two weeks and all of a sudden nobody can remember how to do everything anymore, including me. <laughs> but despite that, we're going to pull it off and we're going to have a terrific meeting this evening. Before I continue, I was writing down notes very fast, and I want to make sure that I got everything right. For instance, I have listed uh, Lou Brown to give the tip of the day. Has Lou shown up? Uh, he says he's going to be late because he's doing coaching or he judging okay. the contest. Cool, no problem. So we'll plan on that, but we'll... Actually, he said he wasn't coming. He's uh, not coming? Okay. He's, he's, in a, he's in a contest that is running very long, and uh, he said he doesn't think he's going to make it over. Well, it's nice to know that somebody else isn't, their meeting isn't going as planned either, so that's okay. <laughs> it makes me feel better. Uh, we'll pass on the tip then. I want to confirm the other roles, if I could, please, quickly. Vote counter tonight is Isabel Kaduri. Kaduri, is that correct, Isabel? Yes. Cool. All right. Thank you. Our timer is Sarah Idahin. Sarah? Outstanding. Thank you. Our general evaluate, uh, our general evaluator is Carolina Ramirez. Cool. Thank you, Carolina. We have three speakers. Our first speaker is Petra Corradal. And evaluating Petra is Andre. Andre Smolenko. Cool. Our second speaker, and I'm, it doesn't have to be in this order, but this is how I wrote them down. Our first speaker will be Petra. Our second speaker will be David and our uh, David Carr. And evaluating David, I forgot to write it down. I'm sorry. Who's evaluating David? Terry, thank you. Terry. Okay. 
And let's see, our third speaker is Graham Kearns and evaluating Graham is Marianne, is that correct? Cool, all right. In that case, I think we are ready to rock and roll. Everybody with me? Then yep. let's do it. We're not having a tip, so I will ask our vote counters because there are some indications that we do, some of us may need uh, retraining on how things go. Would our vote counter, Isabel, would you please remind everybody of what you'll be doing and how they are, more specifically, how they are to vote this evening? Thank you, Toastmaster of the day. Uh, we were doing, we will be using the old fashioned method. So after each prepared speaker and also after the impromptu segment and evaluations, uh, speech evaluation, please uh, send your vote to me via private chat and I will collect and tally the votes. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And our timer this evening is Sarah. Sarah, could you remind people what the timer is doing? And could you make sure that we have the times for our three speakers? Because I don't. Okay, it's my understanding that all three speakers will be five to seven minutes. Is anybody else nope. longer? No, mine is actually uh, 15 to 17, if you would. It's a keynote length. Okay. David? So, Ed. At 15 minutes, we'll see the green light. At 16 minutes, we'll see the yellow light. And at 17 minutes, we'll be red. And you have 30 seconds to wrap up. For the others, five to seven minutes. At, at five minutes, it'll be green light, six minutes, yellow light, seven minutes, red light, and 30 seconds to wrap up. I think we're ready to go then. Thank you, Sarah. We're in good shape. Okay, despite everything, let's get started then. I, can't, I think this is gonna work. All right, our first speaker this evening. Now, of course, the thing is, I actually, our first speaker this evening is Petra Corridal, and I have Please. Petra's value, excuse me, her introduction here. Unfortunately, it's in a type size font six. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Our first speaker this evening is Petra Corridal. Petra joined Toastmasters in 2001 and won District 51 Table Topics Contest in the same year. She earned her DTM designation in 2003 and was awarded the Presidential Citation Honor in 2016. Wow. Petra's life motto is never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Her presentation tonight is called The Mirror of Choice. Please help me welcome Petra Corridal. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Tell me who is the fairest of them all. And the mirror says, the fairest is not you, it's your sister. Ouch, Mr. Toastmaster and friends, have you ever felt disappointed with your look like I did? Oh, you too? It happened to me when I was 10 and my sister was 17. She was tall, shapely, and a beauty contest winner. At 10, I was short, chubby, and I almost won an ugly contest. I tried so hard to look like my sister. I tried on her clothes lipstick, high heel shoes, but I was looking worse. All the bullies top it off by asking me, hey Petra, your sister is so beautiful. Is she your real sister? Ouch! Can you relate? My dear father 
saw the agony in me and he thought if he didn't help me i would remain jealous bitter and a loser all my life my father told me a little folk tale that helped me change the way i look at the mirror of choice like all stories it began with once upon help me a time thank you there was a little mouse who always wanted to be someone else since her body was so tiny and weak she wanted to be someone strong one day she said to the sun the sun if you want to be you you must be the strongest of them all you think the sun is the strongest and the sun said hey no i'm not the strongest look when the cloud rolls by i cannot shine oh gee how come i never thought of that then the little mouse kept on comparing wanting to be the strongest but every time someone else was always stronger until one day she met a strong wooden wall she wanted to be the wall and the wall said hey little mouse do you really want to know who the strongest of them all is it's you you can use your sharp tiny teeth to gnaw through me so you can wander freely in and out you are the strongest of them all your silly mouse am i the strongest of them all yeah actually i am i just forgot to see my own strength friends have you forgotten to see your own strength sometimes sadly many people forget but some people remember their strength despite overwhelming weaknesses do you know helen keller she was deaf mute and blind but not too blind to see her wisdom strength i can relate to some of her struggles at the age of 53 i joined tools masters like you one week after joining i participated in table topics contest and two months later i won district 51 table topic contest yeah before the contest thank you i could have looked at the loser side of the mirror and i could have told myself hey petra how could you win you too old too ugly you had too little training but instead i turned the mirror around and i found a good storyteller the winner in me you still remember the little folk tale that my father told me i'm so grateful before the story i was always disappointed comparing my weaknesses to other people's strength after the story i started seeing my own strength and little by little i started changing from being jealous to being joyous from being bitter to being better from being a loser 
to be a legend. Friends, have you been disappointed comparing your weaknesses to other people's strengths for too long? Don't you want to be joyous, better, and a legend? The secret is the mirror is not on the wall. It's in the power of your hand and it's called the mirror of choice. Toastmaster. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. I'll let our evaluator evaluate it, but I, for myself, speaking for myself, I was impressed. Thank you very much. Our second speaker this evening is David Carr. And David, I apologize if you, you probably provided me with an introduction. I have been looking and for the life of me, I cannot find it. So I'm just going to wing something here. I did find off of the schedule that, let's see, David is, oh, he's speaking from the path not set, level one, mastering <laughs> fundamentals. Okay, all righty. And let's see, a, a five to seven minute presentation. I have no idea what the title is. I have no idea what it's about. And I have no idea which path or project it is. But I do know that David Carr is one of the founding members of Online Presenters. I believe he was might have been the first president of Online Presenters. Is that true? It's true. Aha! Okay, so we're talking about a man here who is not only an experienced Toastmaster, but is one of the founding pillars of online presenters. And I can't introduce his speech, but that's the best introduction I can do for David <laughs> Carr. Please help me welcome the one and only David Carr. All right. Thank you, Jim. It's a half-baked introduction for a half-baked speech, I'm afraid. You know, I, this is not good timing, not only because I have this bandage on my forehead, but because people are complaining about the website today. The website is not behaving exactly as it should. Uh, but I'm going to show you what I'm, what I'm shooting for. I am attempting to make improvements, and I'm uh, very likely breaking things along the way. But this is basically the sign-up experience we've had for a while. This is the WordPress for Toastmasters uh, system that, that I've set up. It does give people the opportunity to have a more dynamic and extensive uh, website, to have a blog, to have other features of the website. And if you go to any of the signup pages and you're logged in, you can click to take a role. So this is kind of the experience that we've had for a couple of years now. Um, there is also actually something in here that will be relevant later. There is a mode you can go into where you can move things around, where you, if you have multiple speakers or multiple evaluators, you can move them from slot to slot by dragging and dropping. Um, that's the way that is supposed to work. Um, but if you really want to make basic changes to this, you actually have to go into the editor. This is actually the WordPress editor. And there are components such as speaker, where if we can see here in the sidebar, there's a space where I can change the number of speakers or the number of evaluators. And the, the virtue of this is that it is the same editor that you use for other WordPress tasks for setting up your home page. But if I wanted to add, for example, a new role, it'll give me all these choices that aren't really relevant to the task at hand, like adding a heading, and I would have to search a little bit to find the Toastmasters agenda role component um, <clears throat> and be able to work with that. So what I've been working on is this new version of the agenda that is a little bit more um, quick and interactive and in the in that example where I have several people signed up and I say I want to make speaker one be speaker two, I can just click 
and rearrange that right here. Uh, and if I want to take that role, I can take it. Um, if I decide I can't speak, which would have been a good idea tonight, uh, I can click reset uh, and then somebody else can then take that role. Um, so we have an edit mode where I can go in uh, and if I'm editing, uh, I can pick from the list of members and assign somebody and then I can put in my path and project details and, my, um, and so forth. Now, I've actually been rebuilding this using uh, a technology that was invented by Facebook called React, JavaScript React. Um, and it's, it's actually uh, very scary um, because if I make any slight mistake, say a typo or something and save that, I will get all sorts of scary error messages down the bottom uh, telling me that I've done something wrong. But in a way that's good because then I get warning that I've done something wrong. So what I'm trying to do is mash that up I actually have two versions of this that I'm working on right now. And I thought by now I might be done, but I'm not. Where I also wanna have the ability to move around the roles. So say you want to do, you had speakers before table topics and you wanna flip that around. So I have sort of the same thing here where I have a take role button and I have an edit mode, but I can also go into this reorganize mode. And so in that example of speaker versus topics master, if I want to put topics before speakers, I can do that very quickly. And I could go back to reorganize and move that again. So this is uh, something that I'm working on. I'm trying to make it both more attractive and easier to use. I can also Let's see, I can also change the, say the number of speakers in that reorganized mode. I can find my way down there. So if I decide that I want, oh, geez. <laughs> um, okay, this is gonna start working any moment now. So one of the challenges uh, I have as a speaker is I do a lot of technical speeches. And so I want to be able to get through these demos where sometimes things are not going right and do it without a lot of umming and eyeing. Um, but this needs more work. <laughs> I will come back another week um, and perhaps uh, show you uh, an actual working version. And uh, in the meantime, I thank you for your indulgence. Mr. Dustmaster. We thank you for your presentation, David. Thank you very much. I'm not going to evaluate your presentation, but I will editorialize for a moment on WordPress for Toastmasters. It hasn't been working the way you wanted it tonight. That's a shame because it is an absolutely awesome software package. I am just amazed at what you have accomplished. And it's unfortunate because it, it is so good that when something doesn't work, that's the part that everybody sees, that the part, that's the part that stands out. But it is just an absolutely phenomenal package. And I look forward to the time when every Toastmasters club is using WordPress for Toastmasters. It is a phenomenal package. All right, let's move to our third speaker this evening, which I have the introduction and it just scrolled away. Okay, back again. Our third speaker this evening is Graham Cairns. Graham is speaking for a 15 to 17 minute presentation. His speech is from the Engaging Humor Path, a level five elective, prepare to speak professionally. Here's his introduction. 
Graham, as you may know, delivers enrichment lectures on cruise ships. He and his wife sail for free, which makes this a pretty good example of speaking professionally. Mm -hmm. His latest lecture is a 45 minute presentation on the real history of pirates. And today he's working on a shortened version of that. So with a prepare to speak professionally speech entitled, Yo Ho, Yo Ho, A Pirate's Life Really, here is Graham Cairns. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, guests, thank you for coming along to this lecture today. You're on a cruise ship. You may not feel like it, but you are. And so I'm going to be talking to you as if you were on a cruise ship. Let's begin, shall we? Why are pirates pirates? They just are. Yes, it's a terrible old joke, but I tell it for a purpose. When we think of pirates, we tend to think of pirates of the Caribbean with their broad West County accents and their swashbuckling demeanour, like Captain Jack Sparrow or Captain Hook from Peter Pan or Blackbeard the Pirate. And we'll have more on Blackbeard the Pirate a little later. But there have been pirates for pretty much as long as there have been ships carrying cargo. There are, in fact, records stretching back three and a half thousand years to what are now called the Sea People. These are groups of pirates who sailed from the Mediterranean and Aegean down to Egypt. In fact, piracy was so widespread that the early Greeks considered it to be a perfectly honourable way of making a living in the poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey. When did it stop being an honourable way to make a living? When the rich merchants started writing the histories. I don't know if there's any connection between those two events. Meantime, in the Malacca Straits of Southeast Asia and in China and, well, wherever there were trade ships, there were pirates. But when we think of pirates today, most of us think of the pirates of the Barbary Coast and the pirates of the Caribbean. The Barbary pirates were Muslim pirates and privateers who operated out of North Africa and into the Western Mediterranean. Now, it's important to differentiate between pirates and privateers at this point. Pirates were, well, pretty much private bad guys. They were ships that preyed on other ships purely for profit and plunder, and they were outside the law. They were flat out criminals. Privateers, on the other hand, were, well, basically they were pirates, but they at least had the legal fiction that they were serving a country as extra militias, a sort of like mercenaries that had what was called a letter of mark from a ruler. Now, if your ship was raided by another ship, it doesn't matter much whether the attackers were pirates or privateers. The result was pretty much the same for you, but legally, at least, there was a difference. You'll note in the picture here that the ships aren't flying pirate flags. They're flying flags of various nations. But the fact remains that if privateers took your ship, then the result was pretty much going to be the same. Now, and here's the thing. Those results may well end up with your death. And that's not good for you, but it wouldn't be by walking the plank. That walking the plank thing is a fictional addition added to stories to make it more dramatic. But let's go back to the pirates of the Barbary. There was no doubt that there was a religious component to piracy in this region. It was a way for Muslim Berbers to try to keep control and some domination over the Christian Europeans who were also seeking to dominate the region. But there was also a purely economic reason for this piracy. Now, there's some argument about the actual numbers, I have to tell you. But there is credible evidence to suggest that up to a million people were enslaved after pirate raids between 1580 and 1780. One million people. So who were these Barbary Corsairs, as they were known? Well, some of the most famous were actually Europeans who had converted to Islam and turned pirate after initially being British privateers. For example, Henry Mannering was initially a lawyer, uh, a lawyer and a pirate hunter, but then he turned pirate himself before eventually returning home and getting a royal pardon. Why? 
go figure. Uh, he later wrote a book titled The Discourse of Pirates and outlined potential methods to hunt down and eliminate his former shipmates. Another convert to Islam was Jack Ward, once described by the English ambassador to Venice as beyond doubt the greatest scoundrel that ever sailed from England. He'd been a privateer for Queen Elizabeth during her war with Spain, but as happened an awful lot, when the war was over, he lost his status as a privateer, so he just turned his coat and became a pirate. He captured a ship in about 1603, sailed it to Tunis, converted to Islam, but his real impact was that he was the one that introduced heavily armed square-rigged ships instead of the, the previously used galleys into the North African area, and that allowed the Barbary's future dominance of the Mediterranean. Other famous Barbary pirates included the Barbarossa brothers. Barbarossa having nothing to do with Barbary, it was actually the Italian word for red beards. The Aldin brothers became Barbary corsairs in the service of the Ottoman Empire. The eldest of them was Oruch, and he was not a nice bloke. He went on a rampage through Algiers in 1516, captured the town with the help of the Ottoman Empire, then executed the rulers of Algiers, no great surprise, and he also executed anyone that he thought might oppose him in any way. That was probably something more of a surprise to the local rulers who had supported him. His younger brother, Hizir, was a more traditional corsair. He was a capable engineer, and he spoke at least six languages. He was appointed the Admiral-in-Chief of the Ottoman Sultan fleet. Under his command, the Ottoman Empire was able to keep and gain control of the Mediterranean for more than 30 years. There is one more Barbary pirate that I'd like to talk about, Sayida ul -Hara. Now, ul -Hara was a, a female Muslim cleric, there's something you don't often hear about, a merchant, the governor of Tetuan, as a woman, and later the wife of the Sultan of Morocco. We, we don't know her birth name. Her nom de guerre literally means noble lady who is free and independent, the woman sovereign who bows to no superior authority. But that's too clunky, so we'll just call her al -Hara. She was born around 1485 in the Emirate of Grenada in what is now Spain, but she was forced to flee to Morocco when she was a very young girl to escape the Reconquista. That was when the Christians reinvaded Spain and Portugal and took it back. Now, in Morocco, she gathered a crew largely of exiled Moors like her and launched pirate expeditions against Spain and Portugal, partly to avenge the Reconquista, partly to protect Morocco from Christian pirates, and, well, let's be honest, partly to seek riches and glory, and she got lots of them. She co-founded the Barbary Corsairs with her allies, the Barbarossa brothers that we just spoke about, and became so wealthy and renowned that the Sultan of Morocco wanted him as his queen, wanted her as his queen. But she would only get married if they could get married in her territory, in Tetuan, where she was governor. Now that, well, you've got to admit, is quite a woman, particularly for the time. So that was the Barbary Pirates. Another great era of piracy, at least in the popular consciousness, is the golden age of piracy in the Caribbean. This is the time of Jack Sparrow, who, well, didn't exist, obviously, he was fictional. Captain Cook, Captain Hook, he also didn't exist. Blackbeard the Pirate, he did exist. And also of Captain Kidd, who you've probably heard about, because he also existed, but he probably also wasn't a pirate. But first, it's important to know that this famous era of pirates, immortalised in books and films, really only lasted about 80 years. There was a confluence of factors here. There was a rise in the quantity and value of cargoes, which were being carried by ships, a rise in the number of sailors with experience in various navies, and particularly the British Navy, and, and this is important, the appalling pay and conditions of those national navies. A sailor who was press ganged into the British Navy, that is a man who was forcibly kidnapped and made to work on a British Navy ship, was supposed to get the princely sum of 11 shillings per month, although that money was quite often withheld by corrupt captains and wouldn't be given to the sailor for months at a time to discourage them from leaving anyway. So that's maybe $600 a month in today's money, but only if they got it, and they very rarely did. The average pirate, on the other hand, could expect the equivalent of a year's wages as his share from each ship they captured. 
the crew of the most successful pirates would often receive a share valued at around a million dollars, at least once in their career. <laughs> it's no wonder they crossed the line into piracy. In fact, it's probably a wonder that more of them didn't. Oh, there was also another driver of piracy, which is not often talked about, but I think is important. Escaped slaves were welcomed into the pirate community and in fact made up as many as a third of all pirates at one stage. They were offered leadership positions that they could never have dreamed of as slaves, such as the position assumed by the pirate known simply as Black Caesar. Now Caesar was a traditional war chief in Africa when he was enslaved and brought to the Florida Keys. Big storm, he escaped with a friend, began a life of piracy, which ended up with him apparently second in command to the famous Blackbeard the pirate. Now, legends and stories surround him, including that he has buried treasure that's never been found. But all we know for certain is that he was captured in the battle that killed his captain, and we'll hear more about that in a minute, and then tried, but acquitted of piracy. And so he went away? No, don't be stupid. He wasn't released. He was instead re-enslaved as a black man and apparently ended up his life as a cooper. That is making barrels of beer and that sort of thing at around the age of 70. But what about his captain, Blackbeard the pirate, one of the most famous of the Caribbean pirates? Well, Edward Teach was a sailor, apparently on one of the privateer vessels in the war between Spain and England and France for the control of the North American continent. And then he settled in the Bahamas and he decided, as the Disney song says, yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. We pillage and plunder, we rifle and loot, we kidnap and ravage and don't give a hoot. We extort and we pilfer, we filch and we sack, maraud and embezzle and even hijack. Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. Quite a colourful ca character was uh, Edward Teach. He apparently used to light fuses in his hat, as you can see here, just to scare away his enemies. Blackbeard once blockaded an entire town in South Carolina and ransomed the people as hostages. He was, somehow, pardoned, but then decided being on the honest side of the law didn't suit, so he went back to piracy. Big dude, really big, quite ferocious looking, but it appears that he actually used bluster and image rather than violence to achieve his aims. In fact, there are no records of him ever having killed or harmed those he'd captured, not something that you would believe if you've ever watched any movies about him. Perhaps that's why he became the archetype for the Caribbean pirate in popular fiction. Not that it did him any good in the end. After Blackbeard returned to piracy, the governor of Virginia sent a party of soldiers after him. They bailed him up on board his ship, Stabbing him 20 times. Oh, and shooting him five times as well, just to make sure. Poor Captain Blackbeard, I'm sad. But if Blackbeard suffered an ignominious fate, at least he deserved it. I mean, he was a pirate. There's no doubt about that. Another famous pirate, Captain Kidd, probably did not. William Kidd was a Scottish sea captain who had clear letters of mark or orders from the king to capture enemy shipping. But he fell foul of some politicians in London and was hanged as a pirate for carrying out their orders. You see, Kidd had established a reputation as a skilled, loyal privateer, that is, as I mentioned, a pirate who had the approval of the king, a sort of mercenary militia leader. But he also had something of a habit of, well, thumbing his nose at the powers that be. For example, he once hand selected a crew for one of his ships and then refused to salute a naval ship as they sailed past. The Navy ship shied, fired a shot. So Kidd's crew then turned around, dropped their trousers and mooned the Navy ship. Not wise. The Navy vessel's captain retaliated by press ganging much of Kidd's crew into naval service, forcing Kidd to sail shorthanded for New York City. Kidd then picked up a replacement crew, the vast majority of whom were known and hardened criminals and former pirates. And soon after, he was arrested for piracy. The big problem, it seems, was that William Kidd was closely associated with some leading opposition politicians back in London, and the government decided to punish him for that. In any case, he was eventually tried and was convicted of murder and piracy, despite having clear orders from the king. And they hanged him in 1701, which again is quite sad.
But what really makes Captain Kidd so famous is the reports, never confirmed, of his buried treasure. Just after he was executed in 1701, there was a song came out called Captain Kidd's Farewell to the Seas, which lists 200 bars of gold and silver dollars manifold we seized uncontrolled. Then there were later novels referring to Kidd's supposed treasure. They included, I don't know if you've ever read Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, but that was about Captain Kidd. Washington Irving's Kidd the Pirate, also about Captain Kidd, and Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, army hearties. Plus, there have been a million bad Hollywood movies about Captain Kidd. But the funny thing is, despite all of those claims of buried treasure, the only booty that was ever actually recovered was a small cache which was found on New York's Long Island, and that was recovered even before Captain Kidd's trial began. So. If there is buried treasure out there, I've got to tell you, it's unlikely to ever be recovered. And that also makes me sad. So it's really a case of, oh, no, oh, no, no pirate's life for me. They'll cut off your head and hang you till dead. Without any gold, this really gets old. So, oh, no, oh, no, no pirate's life for me. Mr. Toastmaster. Oh, no. Oh, no. Thank you, Graham. I learned a lot about pirates. That was great. All right. Look, our timer, Sarah. How did our speakers do this evening? Ah, you posted it, would you? We'd like to hear your voice, though. Could you please tell us what the times were? Everybody nice was in recruits. time tonight. Everybody, Everybody was, in, was time. in time. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you so much, Sarah. And now, would you please pass your votes to our vote counter, Isabel? Pass your votes for the for your the best speaker this evening, Petra, David, or Graham. And again, we're doing it the old-fashioned way. If you would please pass your votes by private chat to Isabel, she will tally them up and report at the end of the meeting who our best speaker was. While, Pet, uh, while Isabel is busy doing that, it is now my opportunity to finish mangling the meeting as I have done and turn it over to somebody else who has almost got to do, by definition, do a better job. And uh, that's going to happen anyway, because our general evaluator this evening is Carolina Ramirez. So I'm delighted to turn control of the evaluation portion of the meeting over to Carolina. Take it away, Carolina. Thank you, Jim. I have a question. Will we have a table topic section? This meeting? We don't have a table topics master, uh, so we can either finish early or somebody can volunteer to be a spontaneous table topics master. You can if post you it in the me, chat. If you want me, I can mm -hmm. ask some questions. If you would like to be table topics master, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Want, you're going to do that first? Yes. And then be general evaluator? Outstanding. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you, thank you. The, content, the contestants today will have between one and two minutes to answer the questions. And the first question says, what was the single most challenging thing that happened to you or in your life the past year? And this question goes to Evie Hartman. Oh man. Okay, I feel I'm about to tell you a very sad story um, because I am, I'm about to tell you a very sad story. So um, so I'm in my mid thirties and it's very shocking to lose someone who is about your age. Um, I am incredibly lucky in that I have never, I had never lost someone very close to me. I've never, you know, I haven't lost my parents, uh, no close family members. You know, I, I've lost a few older relatives, you know, that I wasn't particularly close to, but at my age, it's almost shocking that I've never really had that kind of really close loss. Um, my friend Matt Thompson uh, was the kind of person who was almost too good to be true. Like he was just 
the nicest person. And uh, I, so I'm in a lot of nerd circles, um, playing tabletop games and stuff like that. And he was the kind of person who would make these characters that were just too perfect and just didn't have any negative, like not a negative bone in their body. And it was almost unrealistic. And like, uh, after he got cancer, uh, you know, it was just a little cancer on his knee, you know, he was making jokes about it, you know, fighting the good fight. And as it just progressively got worse and worse over the course of a shockingly short time, um, I started to realize why he would always make those characters so perfect. It was that he genuinely did not have a negative bone in his body. And I felt so bad giving him trouble for all the times that I thought that he should be less perfect because people like that only the good die young, right? And that really holds true for him. Thank you. Thank you, Evie, for sharing your story with us. And we will continue to speaking about the past year because we are uh, confronting a new year. And the, the question says, pick three words to describe this past year. Pick three words to describe this past year. And this question goes to Hector. Three words only. Three words. Describe only. 2022. God, where do I stop? The first one of them for sure is change. I change jobs. I change companies. I changed house. I changed cities. I moved from Evansville, Indiana to Texas, which meant I changed weather. Yep, it's not the same in the Midwest than in Houston, Texas. Oh my God. I learned about 110 degree weather with 85, 90% humidity after being used to nice cold weather in Evansville, Indiana. Luckily, I didn't change family. I stayed married during that process. Second word to describe 2022 for me was challenge. Not that these changes were not challenging enough, but I got a new job, as I mentioned, and this time as a sales manager of a distribution company selling plastics. After being on the sales front, doing the job of a sales rep or a product manager. Now I was in charge of team. And that presented a very different challenge versus having told, okay, these are your goals and go and sell. Now it is, hey, this is your team. Now you go and grow it. Make sure they hit their goals. So that certainly for sure, it is a significant challenge, no word number two. And word number three for me is reunite. Finally, after two and a half years, I was able to see my parents after what it seemed like an eternity because of COVID-19. I was able to visit Mexico and re-encounter family, which is one of the most impactful things that happened to me. For a minute, I thought I will never see my dad again. And that turned out to be a, a great opportunity to see them change, challenge, and reunification. That is how I'll define my 2022. Thank you very much, my Table Topics Master. Thank you, Hector. Thank you for sharing. What were the best books you read this the past year? Christine? Thank you. One of my favorite subjects is books. I love going through books together uh, through Audible with my husband and I, and I have a team that I work with and we read a book together. And many, they're all self-improvement, self-motivation. Right now we're finishing up uh, The Magic of Thinking Big, which is absolutely incredible. And the next one we're starting is Atomic Habits. And what that does is that absolutely teaches you 
that little by little, making little changes are like atom type changes, little tiny ones are going to have a huge impact in the future. And it starts with bad habits, how to make a little change to make it a little bit better. I'm excited. I actually cheated and have half of the book listened to by Audible, but that's okay. I can read it again along with everybody. I love it. I wrote a book and it was launched last January. And that was about a business I've never been in before. And I made so many mistakes. I thought I'm going to write a book and save everybody from making mistakes. And that's through the big word network marketing. And that's, I love, I stayed in and I was able to help others through that, but then learn myself. Sometimes I encourage all of you to write a book because you, the researcher, you, the author, you will be able to learn so much about yourself so much about making a difference, making a change, and it will start within, I can guarantee it. So my challenge to you through this wonderful question is that it's your turn in 2023 to start on your first chapter. With that, back to you. Thank you, Christine. Last question. In what ways, way or ways, did you grow emotionally, Tricia? Oh, that's a challenging question for me. And what ways did I grow emotionally? Um, emotionally, I think I need to work on getting back to who I used to be. Uh, unbothered, unshaken, uh, very good natured. This last year has, has been very trying for me the last two years. I had issues with COVID. Um, for the first time in my life, I had medical intervention. Um, that, that is ongoing um, from COVID. So, and dealing with the medical establishment, which is a field that I work in, in education and traditional medicine. Um, I'm more of a non-traditional medicine person. So it's been very trying and it's conflicting when you have a certain perspective and you're you have expectations from the traditional field things like that so um the respect issue of respect mutual respect from other professionals um trust i've had so many things with trust with this lack of uh, workers in the medical field and other things i just went through a nice little work break time and travel and holidays etc and i've had to update my phone which was supposed to be a good experience and update my modem and, and router recently with comcast and two weeks later I have quite a story to tell just with that. So patience, getting my patience back. So those were kind of emotional growths that were stunted through my experiences the last two years. So my goal is to get back to who I really am. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. Send your vote to our vote counter. The, the, the people is Evie, second Hector, Christine, and Trisha. Vote for your favorite. And now it's time for evaluations. Feedback is a gift, and we have three excellent evaluators today. And the first one is Andri Smolenko. He will evaluate Petra's speech. Welcome, Andri. Thank you very much, Madam General. Evaluates um, our fellow members, most importantly, Petra. Wow, what an incredible speech, the mirror of choice. And your speech was especially designed and carefully crafted for the international speech contest. I, I'll be honest, and I've been given that task to be a judge at the international speech contest. I'm not a good judge. I would give you the first place, the winner badge, so you can put it right next to the glorious trophy you already have. At the same time, I've been given this task and we'll see what I can do. I looked at the criteria for the International Speech Evaluation Contest and I found eight specifically numbered areas that I'm going to do one by one. Hopefully I could make a few recommendations to this incredibly well-prepared speech. 
The point number one is about speech development structure, organization, and support material. Petra, I think you excelled at that. You started with your childhood, the little girl, and being in doubt what's going to happen. And then you introduced new character, a little mouth, to your story. Again, comparing herself to the strong parts of other people, your dad, and a Helen, a woman who couldn't see, who couldn't hear, and who couldn't speak to this story as well. And it developed into the Toss Masters as well. And you use supporting material as the mirror, old fashioned prop. That was excellent. Point number two effectiveness, achievements of purpose, interest, and reception. I feel confident that your speech, the mirror of choice, with the strong message, can just don't compare your weaknesses to other people's strengths, achieve that result. Point number three speech value ideas, logic, and original thoughts. That was an original speech with incredibly powerful value to all of us. Physical appearance, body language, and speaking area. Yes, you play the role. We could see your hands. You stood up. You were a little mouth in one point, and you were a big and strong entity on the other hand. Excellent. Voice and flexibility. That was right there in your incredible storytelling. Mana, directness, assurance, and enthusiasm. Oh, yes, you are the queen of enthusiasm, directness, and assurance. Appropriateness, that was appropriate, let's say, just like that. And then just a grammar, punctuation, and word selection. I would recommend, Petra, for you to watch the recording of your speech. And then you can see a few little twitches that you probably could pay attention to. And overall, one recommendation I would like to make, perhaps right before the conclusion, you could summarize the main points of your speech, you being a little girl, and then a little mouse, and then that Helen and your father, just having a few words about them, bringing them all together, bringing chicken to roost, I think this is what they say it's in English, and boom, with powerful conclusion. Overall, Petra. I really wish you all the best of luck. I hope you will win that contest. I'll give you the prize anyways. Back to you, General Evaluator. Thank you, Andre. Great evaluation. The second evaluator for this meeting is Terry, who's going to evaluate David Carr's speech. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Terry Abramovitz, and I appreciate the opportunity to evaluate David Carr. It's interesting because when you're used to attending your own club and, and you're the members within the club, evaluating actually gets a little easier. You know about them, you know kind of what their topics are. And it's tough when you're coming into a club and you don't know the speakers. But David, thank you very much. It's tough to start out a speech when there was no title and no introduction. So as an audience member, I had no idea where we were going to go. Uh, David, I thought you were very easy to listen to, knowledgeable, interesting. I found what you were talking about was educational and relatable. For me, I, I was a software developer in my career, so I could relate to that part of it. I didn't understand your website. I didn't know what the role sign up was like, so I got a, a little feel for that. Uh, but I got the gist of it, that you have a website and you want to improve it, and you showed us some of the places in which you'd like to do that. And, and I thought your voice was great. If you were to give this presentation again, as an audience member, I would love a little more introduction into what you were going to, to talk about, a little bit of background about where, you're, where you are and where you're heading in your presentation. So that would have helped me better understand. Um, Jim helped actually, helped me by telling the audience how wonderful WordPress is as a site to track your agenda. I've never 
seen WordPress used for for Toastmasters or for an agenda. Uh, so I I did like hearing that from Jim, and I would love to have heard it from you as well to give me, hey, this is a great site, but here's some improvements I think would make it greater. Uh, there's always something in a speech where I, I, I zero in on, and, and that happened tonight with all the speakers. And David, here's where I zeroed in on your speech was I loved that you showed the back end Java code. And I can empathize with the work it takes to make that front end look so great because I know as a developer, an easy front end is a complicated back end. <laughs> so that one page really got my attention. I'm like, oh gosh, yes. It looks simple on the front end. <laughs> Not on the so I, I truly appreciated that. And I really never would have thought to put that in the speech if I were giving it. And I, I really, I really was impressed by that. So David, thank you very much for showing us your site and the improvements that you would like to make. Thank you, Terry. Our third evaluator is Marianne Grady. She's going to evaluate Graham Kern's speech. Welcome, Marianne. Why, good evening. I'm happy to be back with you. It's been a long time. Yo ho, yo ho. Thank you, Graham, for this treasure of a speech. You started with the skull and crossbones, got us right in the mood for everything. And in a very short time, you taught us a lot about pirates. You taught about different types of pirates, the Caribbean and the Barbary. You talked about the difference between pirates and privateers and how slaves escaped slaves became pirates. Who knew that? You use some familiar pirate terms like scoundrel, plunder, buried treasure, swashbuckling, which you know I really thought added a lot of uh, flair and color to your speech. Some suggestions I'd like to give you for your consideration. As a subject matter expert, you are the person who's supposed to know everything. And you used a sentence and you said, I don't know about the connection between these two things. As subject matter expert, I don't think you should say something like that. I think you should know. And the other thing is also towards the end of the speech, you said, don't be stupid. And that is a little derogatory towards your audience. And I don't think you should ever say it in that manner. You, you could say it in a more creative and fun way. And finally, your slides were very illustrative of your topics and really, um, I, thought, I, th I thought they were very interesting to look at. Uh, but I did note that your image, while most of the time it was in the far bottom right of the screen, there were times when you floated above so you could see some of the screen underneath. So I would wanna watch that placement uh, of where you're putting yourself on the screen. You know, I really enjoyed your speech. And I learned a lot, and I know why they hire you to speak on cruise ships. So, yo ho, yo ho, back to you, general evaluator. Thank you, Marianne, for your evaluation. Miss Timer, are all the evaluators qualified? All evaluators qualified. Thank you. Please. Except, uh, Wait a minute, uh, Andre was three minutes, 48 seconds. Andre, three minutes, 48 seconds. So Andre, he's not qualified. Right. Okay. Please send your, your vote for your favorite, Mar Mariana or Terry, to our vote counter. And now it's time for my evaluation for the evaluators. Andre, very encouraging and complete evaluation. And you enhance your evaluation with visual aids. Kudos for you. Terry, great evaluation. And thank you for taking the role at the last minute. And you mentioned very good advice for improvement. And Marianne, you mentioned very good, very good advice for improvement as well. Thank you for your evaluation. And we have some room for improvement. Um, when, Jim, when you present the speakers, please don't forget to mention the, 
the objectives, the project they are working on, etc. I think that you need a little, a little more preparation for this meeting, but as usual, you did a great job. You're a great speaker, Jim. <laughs> and saying this, it's time to announce the winners. And for that, I'll pass the voice to our vote counter, Isabel. Thank you for inviting me. I saw that uh, our Toastmaster Day will announce the winner. Okay, thank you for giving the honor to announce the winner. Our best prepared speaker is Mr. Gran. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And our best table topic speaker is Toastmaster Evie. Congratulations, Evie. And our best evaluator is Miss Marianne. Congratulations. Back to you, General, Miss General Evaluator. Thank you, Savelle. Congratulations to the winners. And Jim, back to you. Thank you, Madam GE. Did we have the, let's see. No, we don't have a grammarian or anything like that. Okay, so we're covered. That's it. we're in great shape. Outstanding, thank you. Well, thanks to everybody. This meeting was, as I say, an exercise in extemporaneous planning. We walked in basically with no roles, filled except the Toastmaster of the day pretty much. That's not true. We did have three timers. So we we had some roles filled, but it was not off to the smoothest start, but everybody pulled together. And that was the incredible part. Everybody pulled together. Everybody said, what can I do to help? How can I help get me involved? And that sort of enthusiasm, that sort of teamwork is what makes the meeting work. So I am delighted that we are finishing a few minutes early. That is a good sign for the rest of the year. I would like to do that more often. So I don't have anything else to say. I appreciate the opportunity of being Toastmaster this evening. And I hope the next time I will be better prepared and I will do a better job. And I will be Toastmaster again sometime soon. In the meantime, I will return control of the meeting to our president, Andrew Byrne. Andy. Thank you very much, Jim. Excellent job, as always, as Festmaster of the day. We are finishing the meeting a few minutes before the end. What I'd like to do is ask the individuals that have visited us to use this experience and share with everyone in the meeting how this compares to other meetings that they've been to. What did they glean from our meeting? Let me first start off with Terry. Uh, thank you. Uh, something that I learned and haven't really done in other clubs is the voting. So I didn't really understand it, what we were voting on. I got the hang of it. I asked some questions behind the scenes in the chat. Uh, but I do like the voting, and it's something that I may take away and implement in my clubs as well. So thank you very much for that. Okay. And although not a completely new member, Hector has been away for a while. So tell us about your thoughts rejoining the club tonight. Well, I will tell you one thing. I, I like to stay with what uh, Jim put on the chat. It's like not getting on a bike after a long time. I also felt a little bit wiggly, but then I just jumped in. It was a great experience getting back on my feet on Toastmasters and also humbling experience because, hey, just uh, as it happened today, it's not always perfect, but you stand up, you face your fears, just like David did with the best uh, face that he, he could and, and went ahead with, with the presentation. I, I think that's a great example because just remind me, Toastmaster is a safe place to fail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heck. And uh, in the new year, I know that Andre was looking at the possibility of submitting uh, President Salenko's name 
for a gavel award, but the Times Magazine year. So how did that make you feel? Well, that makes me feel great um, on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, um, and it just made me think that there is no way those masters after this are going to give him a goal award. <laughs> it's clearly getting quite political. Uh, on the other hand, as Ukrainian, I'm really proud of that recognition of uh, not only one person, but all the Ukrainian nation fights uh, against what's going on. And at the same time, I just um, you know, really hope that uh, uh, the war will be over soon. But thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Okay. I know that we're missing some of our members that normally come, and we should probably send out an email saying how much we missed them uh, at our meeting, like Toro from Japan and other members as well. But we always bring the A game. And Graham always brings his speeches from his cruising experience. And I'm actually going on a cruise around England when I go to my niece's wedding in May. So maybe I'll see Graham on that ship or someone like him. Any event, do we have a Toastmaster of the Day for next week? Who 